Assalamu alaikum and a very warm welcome to everyone. Good morning. Hope you guys are in good condition, good health, and good mental state. Now let's continue our geotechnical series with another interesting chapter. Now we're in chapter four, which is on soil compaction. Now this chapter consists of eight subtopics. So the first part will be discussing from subtopic D1 to D4 and the part two will be from D5 to D8. Before we move into the compaction, let's make a simple differentiation or comparative study between soil consolidation and soil compaction. Point number one. Now if you look at the previous slides on consolidation, the point one that we can take note is that it is a slow process and it can be used for only clay type of soil. So whenever we talk about consolidation, it's a slow process and it is of clay type of soil. And if you look on the other side, on compaction, if you make a versus comparative study, it is an instant process. It can be used for all type of soil. That's the first point. Second, it is a natural process. And for compaction, it is an artificial process. Point number three. Static and sustained loading is applied for a long interval in soil consolidation, whereas in compaction, dynamic loads by rapid mechanical methods like tamping, rolling, and vibration are applied for a small interval in soil compaction. Point number four. In consolidation, soil remains in fully saturation condition, whereas in compaction, soil changes from partially to fully saturation condition. Different point number five, consolidation is due to expulsion of poor water from voids under steady, static, long-term load. As for compaction, it is due to as expulsion and compression of air in soil mass under short duration by moving or vibratory loads. And lastly, dry density of soil increases, but water content will decrease. Try to make sense of this. Where else for compaction, dry density of soil increases, but water content where remains the same. So if you have a comparative table like this, it is easier to go forward with the chapter. Now let's look at introduction. In general, the word compact refers to the verb which means to press closely together. In soil mechanics, the term refers literally to press the soil particles tightly together by expelling air from the void space. In construction, compaction is generally produced deliberately and proceeds rapidly by heavy compaction rollers. This is in contrast to consolidation, which also result in the reduction of voids, but which is caused by extrusion of water from the void space. Moreover, consolidation is not rapid. Now, three important effects from soil compaction is presented here. So the first one an increase in the soil shear strength. So this one makes sense. A decrease in future settlement of the soil. So when the soil is compacted properly, you can prevent upon future settlement. Third, a decrease in its permeability. Of course, when the soil is placed very tightly in such a way that water cannot penetrate through the compacted soil. Now, these three effects are beneficial for various types of land construction, such as we're talking about highways, airfields, and earthen dams. 
And as a general rule, the greater the compaction, the greater these benefits will be. Compaction is actually a rather cheap and effective way to improve the properties of a given soil. The compaction is quantified in terms of soil dry unit weight. So it's expressed with gamma sub d, which can be computed in terms of wet unit weight. So you have the relation of this. Moisture content and you're likely to have this formulation. So in most cases, dry soils can be best compacted and result in a greater density achieved. For each soil, a certain amount of water is added to it. We will look this in the laboratory works on soil compaction. In effect, the water acts as a lubricant and allows soil particles to be packed together better. So you need water for this reason. If however too much water is added, a lesser density results, which you want to avoid. Thus, for a given compaction, uh, compactive effort, there is a particular moisture content at which dry unit weight is greatest and compaction is best. So what is it? Anyone? Very good. The optimum moisture content. Now, in usual practice, in a construction project, is to perform laboratory compaction tests on representative soil samples from the construction site to determine the soil's optimum moisture content and maximum dry unit weight. So these are the first steps. You need to take soil from site and test it in a laboratory. This maximum dry unit weight is used by the designer in specifying design of shear strength resistant to future settlement and permeability characteristics. The soil is then compacted by field compaction method until the laboratory maximum dry unit weight has been achieved. In place soil unit weight tests, so you need a test, are used to determine if and when the laboratory maximum dry unit weight has been reached. So the first procedure in geotechnical aspect is to get soil from the site to the lab and then we extract basic parameters and we conduct another test on site to actually get the basic laboratory parameters. This is case number one. What do you see here? So there shouldn't be this water on the runaway. Now let's look more further into this case. Look at that. It's like a waves from the sea. It has ripples as well. And this is an airport building. Oops. Now a new passenger terminal in Malaysia is sinking. Air Asia has said, with cracks appearing in the runaway and pools of water forming on the tarmac. The KLIA low cost airline terminal, known as KLIA 2, if you still remember, was built last year at a cost of 4 billion ringgit. So it has all these features 68 gates, catering 45 million passengers a year. However, it has come to a criticism over defects in its construction that its main airline. Blames for flight delays, increased wear and tear on planes, and which it claimed pose potential safety risk. So when the ground is not properly prepared in the early stage of construction, you'll get some more effect later. So in the end, they make some issue on this. And lastly, the airport told the news organization that the settling of the ground has been anticipated from the start of the construction. The airport is injecting polyurethane under the ground to address the issue and plans to install concrete slab on the runaway as a more permanent solution. So from here, you have wasted a lot of resources. You construct in the first place. It doesn't work. Problems coming in. And second, you need to construct 
whole new runaway. So this is one resources and two resources, double resources being wasted here. Where else, if you plan properly in the beginning, you might not have this case study. Now let's go to case study number two, Kansai International Airport in Japan. The government had to reinforce a landfill under the Osaka airport after it was found to be sinking. Built on a man-made island and opened in 1994, the airport was anticipated to sink by about 6 meters, but has already sank by 9 meters in the early 1999. By 2008, the cost of the airport was 20 million, with additional costs relating to the sinking. However, the sink rate fell from 50 cm a year in 1994 to 7 cm per year in 2008. And the last case study is Trivuban International Airport in Nepal. Now, airlines flying into the Kathmandu Airport were advised to use small aircraft in 2013 after cracks were found in the runaway. Section of the runaway has lifted, creating small holes along a 3,000 meter long stretch. Two years previously, a section of the runaway had subsided after torrential monsoon rain. Pathetic runaway condition and substandard maintenance arising solely out of poor engineering practice and clumsy management. So again, the same thing that happens in a third case study. Similar with case one, but it's pretty worse because it comes to a clumsy management. Now let's move on to subtopic D2, which is on laboratory compaction tests. Laboratory compaction tests are conducted to obtain source optimum moisture content and maximum dry unit weight. The compaction test equipment consists of a base plate, collar, and mold, and a hammer of course. The mold size and hammer's weight and drop distance are standardized with several variations in size and weight available. So this is the one that you used earlier. You have your hammer, your removable collar and your mold. Basically, you're going to insert soil inside here, compact it, and then you're going to go on to more compaction with the hammer. So let's discuss on the most important effect here. There are two types of specification for the test. One, is ASTM D698 and another one is ASTM D1557 and this is the difference so for for hammer weight for this 698 it is much more smaller compared to the ASTM D1557 and the drop distance is also different this is 305 and this is 457 size of mole remains same constant Volumes also constant except for the last method, which is much more bigger. Now, why is there a difference between two approach? Method A under this designation is known as the modified Proctor compaction test and was developed subsequent to the standard Proctor test to obtain higher values of dry unit weights of densities. It was developed in response to the need for higher unit weights or densities of airfield pavement subgrades, embankments, earthen dams, and so forth, and for compacted soil that is to support large and heavy structures. So please accordingly when it comes to the project in the future, which approach to use? Now these are the steps. Perhaps the most important thing is figure D2, which is the compaction test results. 
So for the y-axis, you're going to have your dry unit weight defined. And for the x-axis is the moisture content in percentage. And two basic parameters is maximum dry unit weight and optimum moisture content is defined. And don't forget your zero air voids line. In figure D2, the right side of the moisture content versus dry unit weight curve roughly parallels to the dash line labeled zero air voids. This line represents the dry unit weight when saturation is 100%. The soil's entire volume is water and solids. This line actually represents, in theory, the upper limit on unit weight at any moisture content. For this reason, the zero air voids line is often included on moisture content versus dry unit weight curves. And it can be determined from this equation. So you have dry unit weight at zero air voids. You're going to plot it with your moisture content to get the line. Now let's move further into subtopic D3, which is on governing factors on compaction of soil. Now several factors affect the compaction of soil. These might be categorized as moisture content, compaction effort, and type of soil. And this chapter is focusing on the effect of compaction effort and soil type. Now compaction effort can be quantified in terms of the compaction energy per unit volume. A function of the number of blows per layer, number of layers, weight of the hammer, height of the drop of the hammer, and volume of the mold. Compaction energy per unit volume is 600 kN per meter cube for the standard Proctor test and 200 kilonewton meter per meter cube for the modified Proctor test, which is much more, oh, which is lesser, sorry, this is 600 and this is 200. Let's find a highlight, okay. Now clearly, the greater compaction energy per unit volume, the greater will be the compaction. In fact, if the compaction energy per unit volume is changed, the Proctor curve will change. Now, figure D4 illustrates the influence of compaction energy on the compaction of a sandy clay as the number of blows per layer increases, the maximum dry unit weight increases, and the optimum moisture content decreases. So, in figure D4, effect of the compaction energy on the compaction of sandy clay. So, we have four data here. This is when you use 20 blows per layer. This is 25 per layer, 30 blows per layer, and 50 blows per layer. You see the difference there? And you have a variety of optimum values. Now, clearly, the type of soil will also affect the compaction of soil. So this is a second effect. The grain size distribution of soil and shape and the specific gravity of the solids as well as the type and amount of clay minerals present affect maximum dry unit weight and optimum moisture content for a given compactive effort and compaction method. Maximum dry unit weight may range from 9.42 kN per meter cube for organic soils to about 22.78 kN meter cube for well-graded granular material containing just enough fines to fill small voids. And the optimum moisture content may range from 5% for granular material to about 35%. Now, higher optimum moisture content are generally associated with lower dry unit weight. Higher dry unit weights are associated with well-graded granular materials. So these are the, all the basics that you need to understand. Uniformly graded sand, clays of high plasticity, and organic silts and clay typically correspond to poorly to compaction. Let's just imagine uniformly graded sand. Means it consists of the same size as to compare with a sample which has big and some small particles. 
to this one respond poorly to compaction where else for this part which is ununiformly graded sand it respond good to compaction so you need to draw out to see a more clear understanding of different type of soil with respect to compaction now moist uh, versus density curves for various type of cells are presented in figure D5. This curve will determine from the standard Proctor method. It should be noted that the both shapes and position of the curve changes as the texture of the soil varies from cost to find. So D5 is a relationship between dry density, water content and different type of soil. So different type of soil will have its unique different type of curve. And this is the moisture density relation for various types of soil as determined by D698 published by Terzaghi 1996. So if you have more soils in our local settings, this is in American setting, Colorado, Illinois and so on, we can also make a table as a research to find our local curve in this type of figure. Now table D2 presents some general compaction characteristics of various soil types along with their values as embankment, subgrade and base material for soil classified according to the USCS. So you have your class, compaction characteristic, and value as base cost, whether it's good or not suitable. We can also make this in a local setting. Now table D3 is a general guide to select soil on basis of anticipated embankment performance. You have your classification here, visual description, and also anticipated embankment performance. So you can choose types of classification with respect to what is the desired performance for your site. And it gives a general maximum dry unit weight values and also the optimum moisture range. So there are a lot of tabulated information for you to choose from for the design of your soil compaction. Now this is subtopic D4 which is on fill compaction. Normally soil is compacted in layers. Okay, if you have a site, layer number 1, 2, 3 and 4. An approximately 203 mm loose horizontal layer of soil is often sprayed from trucks and then compacted to a thickness of about 150 mm. This is a general rule. The moisture content can be increased by sprinkling water over the soil if it is too dry and thoroughly mixing the water into the uncompacted soil by displowing. If the soil is too wet, its moisture content can be reduced by aeration, which is easily by spreading the soil in the sun and turning it with a displow to provide aeration. Actual compaction is done by tempest or rollers and is normally accomplished with a maximum of 6 to 10 complete coverage by the compaction equipment. The surface of each compacted layer should be scarified by displowing and other means to provide bonding between layers. Various kinds of field compaction equipment, for example tempers and rollers, are discussed in the later paragraphs. Now what are tempers? How did it come about? These are devices that compact soil by delivering a succession of relatively light vertical blows. Tempers are held in place and operated by hand. This may be powered either pneumatically or by gasoline driven pistons. Tempers are limited in scope and compacting ability. Therefore, they are more useful in areas not readily accessible to rollers in which case soil may be placed in loose horizontal layers not exceeding 152 mm and then compacted with tempest. So these are the limitations. So 
So these are the manual tempers. A standard one may look like this. But due to this MCO, you can always DIY your tempers. This is a pneumatic tempers and this is a gasoline piston driven tempers. Okay? So three types of tempers. So now we can use which one is more faster or which one is more easily to utilize at site. Now let's go to rollers. It comes in a variety of forms such as the smooth wheel roller, sheep foot roller, pneumatic roller and vibratory roller. Some of these are self-propelled whereas others are towed by tractors. Some are more suited to certain types of soil. That's why it's important to find types of soil at site before choosing which approach to use for compaction. Rollers can easily cover large areas relatively quickly and with great compacting pressure if you are compared to tempers. So I guess the main concept comes from baking. So these are rollers and these are very good chocolate cookies. A smooth wheel roller employs two or three smooth metal rollers. It is useful in compacting base cores. Okay, please understand different type of cores and paving mixtures and is also used to provide a smooth finish grade. Generally, smooth wheel rollers are self-propelled and equipped with a reversing gear so that they can be driven back and forth without turning. A smooth wheel roller provides compactive effort primarily through its static weight. So that's a smooth wheel roller. A sheep foot roller, this is a second type of roller, consists of a drum with a metal projecting feet attached. The third roller, pneumatic roller, consists of a number of rubber tires highly inflated. Now all these properties is very much important in your decision making at site. So you should know the respective information with regards to types of rollers to choose for your site. Say this is a pneumatic roller. A vibratory, vibratory roller contains some kind of vibrating unit that imparts an up and down vibration to roller as it pulls over the soil. Okay, you have more vibration, of course, it's going to be much more easier to compact. So you have your vibrating machine over here. So at, as it goes back and forth, it will vibrate. So it's actually make the compaction easier and much more quicker compared to a static back and forth. Now two means may be used to specify a particular compaction requirement. One is to specify the procedures to be followed by the contractor, such as the type of compactor to be used and the number of passes to be made. The other is to simply specify the compacted salts required final dry unit weight. So two method here, okay, to specify a particular compaction requirement. The first method has the advantage that little testing is required, but it has this advantage that the specified mod procedure may not produce the required result. The second method requires much field testing, but it ensures that the required dry unit is achieved. In effect, the second method specifies the required final dry unit weight, but leaves it up to the contractor as to how the unit weight is achieved. Thus, the method is probably more commonly employed for Method number two. Thank you.